Because the Bureau of Land Management has decided to issue a plan to zero out Saltwells Creek, Great Divide Basin, and part of Adobe Town, starting as early as October 2024, while our first hearing for the lawsuit to stop the zeroing out of these herds isn't until July 16th in Cheyenne, I thought it was very important to replay the interview I did with Suzanne Roy of American Wild Horse Conservation about the Wyoming lawsuit to stop the zeroing out of these herds. I'm your host, Carol Walker, and let's get started. Welcome to the Freedom for Wild Horses podcast, the place to find out about wild horses in the American West and what you can do to help them stay wild and free. If you love wildlife, wild horses, and the freedom that they stand for, this show is for you. I'm your host, Carol Walker. Let's get started. I am absolutely delighted to have Suzanne Roy, the Executive Director of American Wild Horse Campaign, here today. And what we're going to talk about is the lawsuit that American Wild Horse Campaign has filed just a few days ago on the BLM's resource management plans to zero out two wild herds in Wyoming and reduce another to a much smaller size. So we'll just get started today and give you as much information about what the plan and the lawsuit as possible. So go ahead, Suzanne, tell us a little bit about this lawsuit and why it's important. Okay, well, really at stake in this lawsuit is 40% of wild horse habitat in Wyoming, as well as the lives of how many horses are they going to round up there, Carol, if they have their way? 1,700 to 2,000 horses. And right Um, after last year, we had the largest roundup in history, removing over 3,500 wild horses. Right, right. And now they're trying to go for essentially the final, you know, maybe 2,000 horses that are left. And so the lives of a lot of horses are on the line, the lives and the freedom of those horses who will be rounded up with helicopters thrown in holding pens and spend their lives in captivity or worse, be sold into the slaughter pipeline through the adoption incentive program. So there's pretty high stakes for the wild horses themselves. And then in terms of Wyoming's wild horses, generally, they stand to lose 40% of the habitat that's currently available to them with this decision. Why the lawsuit? Well, we've been litigating in the over these horses for more than a decade. I think the first lawsuit we filed was in 2011, which is really right when I started working on this issue. And we learned that the BLM intended to sterilize the White Mountain wild horse herd by gelding every stallion and by over-ectomizing the mares. First, we, you know, this is when we first started on this issue. We worked with the Meyer Glitzenstein law firm, which doesn't exist anymore because the principals retired, but they're very famous in environmental law circles and continue to work. In fact, Kathy Meyer, our attorney, is she started the Harvard Law Animal Law Project. So, But anyway, way back in 2011, Kathy worked with us on this issue. And I believe Bill Eubanks was there too at the time. And first thing we did was we filed a complaint with the Council on Environmental Quality, the CEQ with the White House. And we were successful in getting them to drop the mayor sterilization portion because of how untested it was in wild horses and invasive. And then we had to sue over the gelding portion of that decision. And they basically dropped the decision altogether. And those white mountain horses are still intact and a a wild herd. So that was the first litigation that we filed in this area. And then Shortly after that, the Rock Springs Grazing Association sued the BLM to remove all the horses in the checkerboard. 
And the Rock Springs Grazing Association, as you know all too well, Carol, <laughs> it's a powerful, a powerful livestock grazing association. It's called the RSGA in shorthand. So the area that we're talking about is called the Wyoming Checkerboard. And it's about, is it is it about 3 million acres? About of, 3 million acres total, yes, in the Red in, Desert. In the Red Desert in Wyoming, which dates back to the settling of the West when the government was allowing private landowners to claim one square mile parcels of land in an alternating pattern with public land. So you have one square mile parcels of land alternating private, public, private, public throughout this checkerboard area. And so the Rock Springs Grazing Association owns or controls most of the private land in the checkerboard area. The members of the Grazing Association graze cattle and sheep on the public lands portions, as well as the private lands portions. And so they have been suing the government and advocating for the elimination of wild horses from this checkerboard area since 2011. That was the intent of their lawsuit, saying that they were no longer willing to tolerate wild horses on their private land. And since the government could not keep them off their private lands, they were seeking eradication of wild horses from the entire area. Because, of course, the horses don't know that the land is checkerboard. And so it's open range, it's unfenced, the horses migrate through the whole area. And the Rock Springs Grazing Association said, we, we, we will no longer tolerate wild horses on our private lands. BLM, it's up to you to keep them off. And since you can't do that, we want them eliminated from the entire area, public and private lands like. I mean, basically, that's the heart of the battle that we've been engaged in with you, Carol, too. Since 2011, I believe we intervened in their lawsuit in 2012. So, you know, fast forward 11 years, we're in the situation we are now where the lawsuit was settled by the government with a consent decree. And this was an agreement between the two parties. It was not a court order, right? It was an agreement between the Rock Springs Grazing Association and the Bureau of Land Management, in which the BLM agreed to evaluate essentially what the Rock Springs Grazing Association was demanding which was the complete elimination of the Great Divide Basin herd management area, the complete elimination of the Salt Wells Creek herd management area. So those two areas would be zeroed out, which means every wild horse would be removed from those areas and those areas would be returned to herd area status which means no wild horses would be tolerated in those areas. The management level for those areas would be set to zero. And so that was one of the components of the consent decree. The other was that the White Mountain herd, which is the herd where the wild horse viewing loop goes through in that area. The, I know Sweetwater County and the city of Rock Springs, they spent a lot of money to create this wild horse viewing loop in White Mountain HMA. And so the consent decree called for sterilizing, reducing the number of horses allowed in that area and sterilizing all the horses, going back to the 2011 battle thing. And so that was the other component. And then they want to reduce the Adobe Town herd management area, which is a combination of checkerboard land. And then there is a solid land block there as well. And so what they want to do is eliminate the checkerboard portion of the Adobe town, which would basically slash the size in about half, I think. Well, no, actually the checkerboard's only 40,000 acres. It's less than 10% of Adobe town. They're talking about eradicating almost half of Adobe town Oh, um, right. Because they're concerned about horses coming from Adobe Town and going into Saltwells Creek. Oh, Saltwells Creek. Right. Thank you, Carol. Carol has been involved in this for 
long as I have and is there on site many times a year and knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> so thank you. That's that's right. So anyway, the size of the Adobe Town HMA will be slashed in half. So with the consent decree, the BLM agreed to evaluate these demands and these proposals. It did not require Require them to implement it. And in fact, the consent decree says very specifically that anything the BLM does has to comply with federal law, obviously, but it's a specific term of the consent decree. So the BLM is mandated under the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act to protect wild horses. And what they did was they undertook an environmental process, they did an environmental impact statement to amend their land use plan, essentially to implement the Rock Springs Grazing Association's demands in the area. So just two weeks ago, the BLM signed the decision record to implement these changes, but they made one modification to the demands, which was they are no longer going to sterilize the White Mountain herd because the local governments objected to that aspect of the plan it's a wild horse viewing loop. They didn't want a bunch of sterilized horses that really wouldn't be exhibiting those wild free roaming behaviors that people want to see and that the county and the city regularly advertise as these wild horses symbolizing this place in the West where the wild is still alive. And so they felt that sterilizing those horses would take that away. So That is the one decision. So the the decision record calls for zeroing out Saltwells Creek HMA, zeroing out Great Divide Basin HMA, cutting the size of the Adobe Town HMA in half, and also the appropriate management level for that area would also be significant. In half. Yeah. In half. And And White Mountain, I think they also said that Population control methods could be quite aggressive. It may end up being sterilized anyway. They did say fertility control would be utilized and with a very broad definition of what fertility control would be. So that that is still a risk. That is true. We knew this was coming. You know, we've dealt with the BLM Wyoming for a long time. And we, we know that the Grazing Association has great power there. And so we were prepared to sue. And so shortly after the decision, I think within a day of the decision being released, we were in federal court with the American Wild Horse Campaign, the Animal Welfare Institute, Western Watersheds Project, Carol is a plaintiff, and Kimberly Curl, another photographer like Carol, who photographs the checkerboard horses, and as well as Chad Hansen. Chad Hansen, right. And what's Chad's group called? The Institute for Got Range and Mustang. And, well, yes. No. Well, anyway, Chad Hansen is a <laughs> wonderful <laughs> academic in Wyoming. He is, teaches sociology at Carroll University of Wyoming, Casper. In Casper, yeah, University of Wyoming. Okay, he's a sociology professor. He's written a wonderful book called Land of Awe about wild horses inspiring a reverence for nature that's so essential to the future of our environment that people have that reverence for nature. And it's a wonderful book. And he has a nonprofit organization with his wife, Lynn Hansen, who is a photographer as well. And so Chad also joined our lawsuit. And so that is the status of the lawsuit. It is pending in federal court. There's a lot riding on the line with it. As I said, 40% of the habitat for wild horses in Wyoming, the lives and freedom of thousands of horses. And just, you know, the, the eradication of two really iconic, beautiful herds, on a stunning landscape that Carol has so beautifully documented over the years. I mean, her photos are so inspiring. And if you see them, you know, thinking about that, this could all be lost. It's, it's, it's very disturbing. And so the stakes are pretty high with our lawsuit. Saltwells Creek and White Mountain are two of the only herds in Wyoming that have curlies. 
There are also curlies in Nevada, I believe, but these are the only two herds in Wyoming. And these curlies are quite rare and quite amazing. They uh, tend to be larger horses. Their hair is curly. They're hypoallergenic and they are remarkable. And there's only so many wild curlies left and to eliminate, you know, most of them with eliminating Saltwells Creek would be a real shame. And the locals love the Saltwells Creek herd. I mean, they, they really do. And they go visit, they go visit them. People come from all over the world to visit this herd. Great Divide Basin and Adobe Town are less well known, but Saltwells Creek certainly has a huge following as does White Mountain because they have the loop tour, the tourists go there, it's an easily accessible herd and to lose them would be, would be really tragic. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's so ironic, you know, the state, they've used wild horses in their tourism. They promote that Wyoming is still a place where wild horses still run free. You know, it's the untamed spirit of the West right there in Wyoming, come visit it. And now they just want to wipe out these iconic wild horses in this area. And it's just ridiculous. It, and, and it's just a, I mean, it's a land grab. It's hard to imagine that it's anything but a government facilitated land grab by a very powerful livestock grazing association. Right. And when you have the BLM saying that the reason we should do this is because it's just too difficult to manage the checkerboard area. And they would just as soon manage it as though it were all private. And this is not a reason to eliminate a herd. And that's the other reason the lawsuit is so important, because then if they get away with this, they're going to say, well, this area, it's very difficult to manage. So we're just going to zero it out. Essentially, if this is allowed to stand, it would give private landowners the right to really determine what happens on public lands because they say, you know, oh, you can't keep the wild horses off my private land. So we want you to remove them from the public land too. Well, that's not the law, right? The law can say that the BLM is required to keep wild horses off people's private land any more than the Wyoming Department of Wildlife is required to keep elk off people's public land or antelope or deer, you know, I mean, they're wild animals. And so our lawyer, Bill Eubanks, who's a very respected environmental lawyer, he says this could be one of the most, if not the most important case filed in decades over the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act. And again, also Wyoming is a fence out state. So if they don't want the horses, they have to fence them out. Now, fencing one square mile parcels across the checkerboard is, you know, uh, not practical, but legally that's the law. If you don't want them, you have to fence them out. And you can't, you can't zero out a herd or enact these things because you're afraid they're going to trespass. That's not in the law. That's not in federal law. Right. And in fact, we want a case about that. The BLM received a request to remove horses from. So there is something in the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act that does allow a private landowner to request removal of wild horses from their private lands. But it is not a perpetual request. It is a specific request for a specific group of horses or horse at a certain time from their land. There is no perpetual obligation of the BLM to clear wild horses off private lands. The Rock Springs Grazing Association requested removal of horses from their private lands. The BLM didn't do it fast enough or whatever. They sued and the BL, what, what the BLM, oh no, this is it. You know this better than I do, Carol. But the BLM used the private landowner request for removal of horses as an excuse to propose the removal of all the horses from the area, saying that they couldn't keep the horses on public lands. So they wanted to move them all in the area. We went to court. 
we won at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals with the judge saying you can't ex- use a request from a private landowner to remove horses as an excuse, as a justification for removing horses from public lands. That violates the law. We won that. We also, at the same time, won a case where the state of Wyoming had sued the BLM and we intervened on the part of the BLM, actually. The state was suggesting or alleging that the BLM was violating federal law by failing to remove wild horses from public lands as soon as their populations exceeded the so-called appropriate management level. And we we intervened. It went to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals and we won. And the decision says, no, the BLM is not obligated to remove horses immediately when their population number exceeds the appropriate management level. The law is very specific about how the BLM can remove horses from the land, and it's a two-step determination. First, they must determine that an overpopulation exists. And overpopulation is not automatically equivalent to over AML. The horses can be over AML and not be overpopulated. So the BLM has to make a decision that they're overpopulated, and then they have to make a decision that they have to be removed in order to restore the ecological balance in the area. But they have discretion in that decision, in that second decision, and they can choose to address overpopulation in a number of ways. One way is by reducing livestock grazing, because the BLM has a very specific regulation that says they can reduce or eliminate livestock grazing from wild horse habitat, from herd management areas, if necessary to provide forage and provide for the health of the horses. And so they can do that. They can reduce livestock grazing. That's an option. They can also implement fertility control to humanely reduce the population over time. So there's no required removal of horses. And that's what the 10th Circuit decided. And that is a prevailing case law right now. And so we, you know, and Carol's been, you've been with us in every step of this legal battle, but this is, it's all culminating at this point when they want to make the final decision to eradicate the horses from this whole area. And so a lot of the principles that we've been battling for are at stake here, you know, allowing private landowners to dictate what happens on the public lands. And that allowed to go through, then you're right. It would jeopardize every wild horse in the West because every herd management area has private land adjacent to it or within it. And state land as well. And state land as well. Yes. Right. It's all of them. Not not a you know, the checkerboard pattern here is is larger than in other areas, but it is not uncommon. Or unique. Have, no. Um, there's or unique, a mix of right with private state land, BLM land, sometimes Bureau of Indian Affairs land. It is not an uncommon situation. So an adverse decision here would have really significant impacts for wild horses across the West. And I think something that people have no idea about is the grazing association, the Rock Springs Grazing Association. We're talking about 24 families. This is not a huge number of of ranchers, and it's just unbelievable that they have so much power in this area. And and we have the American public who wants to keep these horses, and there are horses. They don't belong to the Rock Springs Grazing Association. They belong to the American public, and these are public lands that we're talking about. Right, and remember, the... Protection of wild horses is mandated under federal law by the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, while the livestock grazing on public lands is a discretionary activity, and it's it's authorized at the discretion of the Secretary of the Interior. There it's is a privilege, a, not a right. A privilege, not a right. That's something that very few ranchers recognize, but some of them do. 
<laughs> so I've, I've known some that understand that it's a privilege, not a right. And there's a stewardship responsibility that comes with that. And that includes protecting wild horses and the land. So that is the situation. And wild horses very often get scapegoated for any land degradation, even though, you know, I see every year they put the sheep out the minute the grass comes up. Right now, we had one of the worst, longest winters since the 70s, and the cattle are out, and the grass is barely coming up. And a sure way to destroy forage is to put livestock out there in huge numbers when the growing season is just beginning. And this happens every year. And then to say that the wild horses are responsible is crazy. Also this morning, I was out and the sage grouse do their mating dance in usually in April. They're a month late because things are, the winter was so long. And I was out before dawn and I got to see the sage grouse doing their dance, the the males doing their dance and the females flying around. And it's just an amazing thing. And the wild horses get blamed for the reduction in sage grouse habitat, which is absolutely crazy. They actually hunt sage grouse in Wyoming and Colorado. And to say that they're endangered because of the wild horses is just laughable. But it's somehow logic is missing from these equations when they <laughs> I mean, they're so concerned with the sage grouse, but they hunt the sage grass. If right. they're so endangered, why the heck are they hunting the sage grass? Right, exactly. It doesn't make sense. We have to protect their habitats, no doubt about that. But yes. hello, like if you're worried about the number of birds, why are you killing the birds? Right, exactly. And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting when reading the the lawsuit of what was filed is something that we kept bringing up was that you could do land swaps. Yes, I was just going to say that. Absolutely. The, of, of the private land to consolidate the public land parcels so that this would be less of a problem. But the reason this is never going to work is because the Grazing Association has locked control over these areas because they have leases on the public land and they own private land. And so there's no incentive for them to do land swaps and make it much more of a areas of public land so that we could manage the horses on public land. Exactly. We, and we submitted that alternative well, numerous times and yes. we, we even developed a, you know, a proposal that was submitted through legal channels to say, this is an alternative. If you're saying that this is a difficult situation to manage, this is an alternative that would allow you to uphold your mandate to protect wild horses. And because they just, you know, they rejected it. There is precedent for land swaps to resolve public lands management issues. It is not like something that's never happened, but the status quo allows the Rock Springs Grazing Association to control the whole area. And so they have little motivation. And if the government isn't willing to say, well, you know, your public lands leases are at the discretion of the government. So if, you know, I mean, they have leverage, right? But no, not willing to use it because of the pressure that the livestock industry puts on the government and the hold they have on policymakers at the BLM and elsewhere. So I've had a number of people asking on social media when, you know, what's what's the next step with the lawsuit? What's the time frame? And of course, lawsuits take a while. What do you think as far as that's concerned? What's going to happen is the the government's going to file an answer to our complaint within a, I think it's usually 30 to 60 days. Then it goes before the judge. And that's basically, they say, yeah, we're going to defend this case, you know, and then it goes to the judge and then the judge will set a briefing schedule. And these things can be prolonged. I think the cases that reached the 10th circuit were at least three years in the making. Don't you think, Carol? Yeah. In fact, one of them where they took foals where they hadn't, so they ended up taking 400 more horses than they had actually said that they were going to take. We won that, 
but the horses were already in holding facilities. And so we weren't able to put them back. So the time frame can be unfortunate, but we don't have a roundup scheduled right now. Right. We don't. The BLM has very limited funds. And around. very limited space in holding facilities very at this point. Limited. Yes. It's over 60,000 wild horses and burros in holding facilities. They really literally can't bring more horses in except, you know, whatever's on their roundup schedule, which is significantly reduced from last year. So we don't know. The problem is with the law, when you file a case like this, if there's a pending action, let's say the the roundup was on the schedule to zero out the Saltwells Creek horses or, or Great Divide, we could file for a TRO or preliminary injunction to stop that roundup. But it's a very high burden to show irreparable harm because What's being irreparably harmed is the horses, you know, the history of destroying the history of the area, whatever. They don't have standing in court. The horses don't have standing in court. So we have to say that we are being irreparably harmed by the removal of these horses. Now, in a regular roundup decision where they're doing, like when they remove more horses, there were still going to be horses left in the area at the supposedly at the management level. So the court said, well, you're not going to be irreparably harmed because there's still going to be there's still horses. Yeah. Now, in the case of Salt Wells and Great Divide Basin, if their plan is to come in with one fell swoop and remove all the horses, we we might have more grounds for convincing a judge that that is irreparable harm because there wouldn't be any horses left. In That's a really good point. Areas. Absolutely. And demonstrate, you know, the unique nature of those horses, et cetera. Unfortunately, the courts, you know, they don't move fast, but it's really important that we see this through. Yes, absolutely. So what else, what else is there to tell people that we haven't covered about this lawsuit? Lawsuits are expensive Lawsuits and are. American Wild Horse Campaign needs your support. So donations for the lawsuit are very, very necessary yes. for us to be able to continue, especially if we end up having to go to the next level with the lawsuit, if we have right. to go to appeals court. And that's probably, that's highly likely, I would say, given the, the scope of the amendments and the issues that are raised. It's highly likely that we could get a adverse decision on one of the issues, but a positive decision on another. But we would feel that the adverse decision on, on one of our claims was so significant that we had to take it to the 10th Circuit. Or we could lose the whole thing at the lower court level. And, you know, we've done enough of these cases where we've won enough claims that I think it's going to be taken seriously by the judge in Wyoming. But there could be, you know, if it's partially in our favor, we might feel that what was not in our favor was so significant that we have to take it to the appeals court. And once you take a case to the appeals court, and if you win, you establish case law. So then in the 10th Circuit, which does include like Colorado, Wyoming, a lot of Utah too, I believe. Yeah circuit. Yeah. So this is a significant amount of wild horses in these areas. If we establish case law or when we have established positive case law, which we've done in two cases, then if other cases are filed over wild horses in Utah or Wyoming or Colorado on similar issues, the court has to look at the case law we've established as, you know, a law basically. And so it helps with other litigation to take these cases up to the appellate court and win. That was another thing that people always ask that I think it's good to explain is that people say, well, why don't you sue over every single roundup? Oh, right. Well, <laughs> good question. Because the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act has been amended over the years under pressure from the livestock industry. And the current state of the law does allow the BLM to conduct roundups. 
And once they've gone through the process of environmental review, making a determination of overpopulation, determining that excess horses have to be removed, they are legally allowed to do it. And there have been very few, there have been cases challenging AML and, and all appropriate management level and all that, but very few have succeeded because it is it is generally allowable under the law. Obviously, you have to look and the attorney has to look and see, is it likely that right. Is it because like- of the nature of the case that it would win? Because exactly. bad case law can be can actually be a detriment to That's future true. cases. So there's two two decisions we weigh. One is what's the likelihood of success, and what's the likelihood of creating bad case law if we lose, and the odds of success aren't strong. And then the other is is this a appropriate use of donor funds. We try to be very careful about only bringing litigation that we feel we can win and not create bad case law. So that's why I know it's frustrating for people because it sure seems like it should be like just sue. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. It's not that easy. And people have done it. And and it, it, it you know, then then we have to overcome bad case law when we're arguing cases that do have a better likelihood of success. So it is a really important point to raise. Yeah. You know, I mean, this situation here is, I mean, looking back over the history of litigation here, this has been a huge focus for the American Wild Horse Campaign. And yes. for you, Carol. And I'm so grateful. I am so oh, grateful. Yes. Well, thank you. I mean, we, it's really important and we're very, very dedicated and committed to seeing this through for the checkerboard horses. And I'm just glad that we've been able to bring to the table such a strong team of attorneys that the starting with Meyer Glitzenstein and Kathy Meyer, who is like, you know, an icon of animal law and environmental law. And then with Bill Eubanks, who worked with Kathy and now has, after Kathy retired, has formed his own law firm, Eubanks and Associates. He's the, one of the top public interest, I'd say he's probably the top public interest environmental lawyer in the country. And we're really grateful to work with him. He does, he is a wonderful person and quite brilliant. We've seen him argue in court, remember? Carol? Yes. Yes. It was amazing getting to go to yeah. court and watch. It was just an amazing experience. And he was so good. He was. And the judge really, you know, respected him, I think. Yes. Yes. And so we're really lucky. And 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 Bill is a, you know, he's very committed to public interest law and he charges below market rates. And I'm glad we could bring the resources to the table to to do this because yes. it's an important fight. And we can't just sit back and let them wipe this area out of these unbelievable horses. When I came out with you a few years ago and and to see the horses, it was so magnificent. And the area is the red desert and it's, it's so, so beautiful. So beautiful. And the horses are such a part of the landscape of the yes. Red Desert. And they're part of what makes Wyoming special. And, you know, we just have to save them. Carol, what it, what brought you to the checkerboard? When How did you start photographing the horses in the checkerboard? Back in 2004, I went out on a tour of Adobe Town. And I fell in love with the horses. And then when I found out they were being rounded up, a year after I had made my first trip, I was devastated and I decided I had to do something to help them and show people that they're not starving, they're not dehydrated, they're a unique part of the land and they're very well suited to it and they need to be preserved. And I thought it was going to be a quick fight, you know, over in a few years. And of course, here it is 2023, but they are worth fighting for. They are worth fighting for. This area, especially Saltwells Creek, I was just so surprised at how lush it is. There was, when we were out there, it was, you know, the drought. This area didn't suffer. The Saltwells Creek area didn't suffer as much in the drought, but there was so much grass and there was water. And when we came up on that hill where all those horses, I don't know, like 50 horses, was it, were, were napping? 
that was like the coolest thing I've ever seen that like they were napping together in their family groups and little <laughs> adult horses around you know, little foals. And it was just so beautiful on this beautiful landscape with grass. And it, it was just amazing, like idyllic. It's like, that's what we have to protect, you know? And it, it, it's just, I wish everyone could have the experience of seeing that because it really is beautiful. Yes. We need to keep it available so people can come out and see them. And I always tell people, if you get an opportunity to go see wild horses, do it, get out there, go see them. There's nothing like it. And once you're out there, you can understand why it's so important to keep them wild. Yeah. Yeah. Just the feeling you get when you see them, of course, they're so beautiful. They're so magnificent. So even a non-horse lover, like I'm a horse lover. I'm sure you're, you know, a horse person, even people who aren't, they, they appreciate the majesty of these animals and the landscape they live on. And then what they symbolize, like just seeing them out there living on their own terms, choosing, choosing their friends, choosing their family, choosing where they go every day. It's such a different thing than we view with domestic horses, you know, they're just so iconic on that landscape that I don't know anyone who's not inspired by seeing them out there. Yeah. Pretty amazing. So thank you for taking me and my husband out there. <laughs> that was Yes. Great. It was really fun. Yeah, it was. It was fun. It was very nice. I hope we can save these horses for sure. We're, yeah. we're committed to seeing it through. And I, I want to encourage people to follow American wild horse campaign to sign up for the newsletter so you can get alerts and find out what you can do to help. Follow at Free Wild Horses on Instagram and donate to the legal fund, AmericanWildHorseCampaign.org. This is going to be a really significant fight and we could use all the help that we can get with this lawsuit. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. And it really, it is, it is important that, you know, people who care about the horses and support wild horses they they fuel this work like we could not do it without them and and so every contribution matters and lets us file litigation like this or work for better legislation do some of our field programs for fertility control or habitat conservation so it's it all it, it none of it could happen without people being compassionate and passionate about protecting wild horses and supporting the work. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for coming on today. Well, thank you, Carol, for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you for everything you've done for these horses over the years and being part of this effort. Thank you for listening to this episode of Freedom for Wild Horses. If you want to learn more, follow me at www.wildhoofbeats.com for more information and for ways to help America's wild horses. See you next time.